Before you start, the first thing we're going to discuss when we analyze strains in multiple dimensions, 2 or 3D, is the concept of deformation gradient. Deformation gradient. And the trick in deformation gradient is to look at close points in the undeformed configuration and see where these points go in and the relationship between these two points in the deformed configuration. So here we have our undeformed body. We have two points. Let's call these two points A and B. And they are infinitesimally close. So they are not really at a large distance from each other, but at a very small infinitesimal distance. And then this body after deformation will look differently. And these two points will move to new locations. So A is going to be here, and maybe B is going to be here. And what we want to do is to see how the relative position of these two points changes between the undeformed configuration to the deformed configuration. And that's really not all that difficult to do. Because let's say that the, look, the position vector of A is RA. And the position vector of B is R B. So if you think about it, if this position vector is given by a location x, y, and z, if we are in 3D, and of course in 2D it would be on the x and y. And since R B is at an infinitesimal distance from R A, we can write this as x plus delta x, y plus delta y, and z plus delta z. That shouldn't be the big problem. OK. So now let us see where these go in the deformed configuration. A will go to R A prime, and B is going to go to R B prime. By definition, the difference in position between the deformed configuration and undeformed configuration is the displacement. So the displacement of point A is really the vector Ra prime minus Ra. So if we can always express Ra prime as the original position plus displacement. And we will assume the displacement components along x, y, and z are called u. V and W. The same will apply in the case of V. Now, the vector connecting A to B can easily be obtained in the original configuration by subtracting RB minus RA. So let us call this vector E. It will be simply dx, dy, dz. 
not complicated. Now let us look at the same vector in that deformed configuration. It would look like dx plus ub minus ua, you can think about it as du, so change in u between the two points. dy plus dv and dz plus d w. Okay, so we have two vectors now. A vector that describes the relation or the relative position of two material points in the undeformed configuration and the corresponding vector in the deformed configuration. The relationship between these two vectors is the deformation gradient. So by definition, the deformation gradient is the relationship between the vector, infinitesimal vector, yeah, in the undeformed configuration mapped to the deformed configuration. Okay, so question now is how to create this guy. See, we have two configurations. So we have the undeformed and the deformed configurations. And we can think of a displacement of a given material point so this is a point A, for example, here, and it moves to this position here in the deformed configuration. So we can think about the displacement, which is the change in position between the deformed and undeformed configuration, either as a function of the original location of the particle or as a function of the deformed location of the particle. It's up to us to choose. But the trouble is, usually we don't know the deformed position of the particle. This is what we're really trying to predict. So, in many cases, it is convenient to consider displacements to be vectors that depend on the original position of the particle, where x, y, and z are, as we have seen in the previously, are the described the location of um, a particle in the undeformed configuration. So our displacement vector is going to be function of x, y, and z, which means that u is function of x, y, and z v is function of x, y, and z, and w is a function also of x, y, and z. Okay, so let us pick one of them. Let us take a look at u. So now we come back to point b. Point b was at a location x plus delta x, y plus delta y, and z plus delta z. So what we want to do now is to compute the change in u between these two points. This would look like u of x plus delta x and y plus delta y and z plus delta z minus u of x and y and then, and from calculus, it's not difficult to see that up to first order, that change in u is nothing other than derivative of u with respect to x times delta x plus derivative of u with respect to y delta y plus derivative of u with respect to z delta z. Yes? Yeah? 
So, same will apply for V and W. So, we can put them in a matrix, and that matrix we call displacement gradient. And we give it the symbol H, and this is equal to Ux, U comma Y, U comma Z, V comma X, V comma Y, V comma Z, and then W comma X, W comma Y, W comma Z. And the reason why we call it a gradient is that the derivatives of a scalar function with respect to X, Y, and Z are the define the gradient of a scalar function. And H, if you look at the column, the first column is derivative of the displacement vector with respect to X. The second column is the derivative of the displacement vector with respect to Y. The third column is the derivative of the displacement vector with respect to Z. So it is pre pretty much the gradient of the displacement vector. Very well. So now let us go back to our uh, deformation gradient and see how to compute it based on the displacement gradient. So if you remember, we had E was given by dx plus du, then we have dy plus dv, and then dz plus dw. It's not difficult at all to see that this is E prime, sorry. While E itself was nothing other than dx, dy, dz. It's not difficult to see that we can write E prime to be nothing but E itself, that's the first part, the dx, dy, dz, plus du, dv, dw, is H, the displacement gradient, times a vector that contains dx, dy, dz, which is nothing but E itself. And as such, we can now write E prime to be equal to a unity matrix plus the displacement gradient times the original vector E. So now, all of a sudden, the relationship became pretty simple. And this now, by definition, is our deformation gradient. So deformation gradient is just a unity matrix plus the displacement gradient, where the displacement gradient just contains the derivatives of displacements with respect to position. And what it does is that it maps vectors from the undeformed configuration to the deformed configuration. Very well, so now we have defined the deformation gradient which maps infinitesimal vectors, material vectors from the, the undeformed to the deformed configuration. Okay, so now let us look at what happens to the length of vectors. So, if you have a vector E in the 
undeformed configuration and you want to compute its length, we, you know, the double bar means norm. And it's so difficult to see that this is nothing but E transpose times. So for example, let us say that we are in 2D and the vector has components 1 and 2. If you want the length of that vector, you transpose it, multiply it by itself. This will give you 1 times 1 plus 2 times 2, which is 5, which is the correct length squared of the vector. Yeah? So we can express it in matrix form. So the original length of the vector squared is E transpose E. Okay? Very well. Now let us look at the norm of E prime. Squared, this will be E prime transpose times E prime, which is equal to, since E prime itself is F times E transpose times F times E. And this simplifies to E transpose F transpose times F times E. So we end up with E matrix which is always squared, by the way, this is a quadratic form, if you remember from our linear algebra review. This is a symmetric matrix, so, and, and the length squared in the deformed configuration is, so we can call this L prime squared, and this, we call this L squared. Sometimes the arc length or the distance is called GS. It doesn't make a lot of difference what we call it. The basic idea here is F transpose F is a symmetric matrix. It is usually called C. And this is in honor of the man who almost single-handedly invented continuum mechanics and he's a French scientist by the name of Cauchy. So this is called Cauchy tensor and sometimes called Cauchy's measure. So basic idea here is that this matrix C, which is symmetric, defines the new length of a vector in once we know the vector in the original configuration, in the undeformed configuration. Very well. Now, the trouble is, if you want to work with one-dimensional string definition that says string is the length in the undeformed minus length in, uh, length in deformed minus undeformed over the original length, you will see that it's, it's not actually very easy to do that because the length will depend on direction. So for every direction, there will be a different change in length. So it actually doesn't work very well as a string definition in multiple dimensions. So what do we do in that case? What we do is we start looking at the ratio of length in the new configuration to length in the old configuration as a function of direction. Of course, this is length squared over length squared. So, and interestingly enough, this ratio here defines what we call in mathematics, a Raleigh quotient. And 
from the mathematical properties of Rayleigh quotient, there will be certain directions of the vector E for which this ratio is either a maximum or a minimum or a stationary value. And these directions will be given by the eigenvalue problem C minus lambda I times E equals zero. C is actually a positive definite method and it is not very difficult to see why because it is E prime transpose times E prime and E prime it's the norm of a vector so it cannot be negative. So instead of calling the eigenvalues lambda, we can call them lambda square just to emphasize that we know for sure that we are positive. So the corresponding values of lambda square will give us the maximum and minimum and ratios of uh, stretching, which is the ratio of the new length to old length of the vector. And the corresponding directions will be the directions of the maximum and minimum stretching of, of vectors. And as we discussed in eigenvalue problems, the, these directions, if we are in 2D, there will be two directions which are mutually orthogonal. And in 3D, there will be uh, also directions which are mutually orthogonal, three of them. And if we rotate the axes to coincide with these principal directions, so these are usually called principal strain directions. Yeah. These principal strain directions, if we rotate the coordinate system in that direction, we find that C will take the form of the diagonal matrix. So C will take the form lambda 1 squared, lambda 2 squared, and lambda 3 squared, and zeros everywhere else. So this will be in principal directions, which are defined by the directions of the eigenvectors of this eigenvalue problem. And as such, we can calculate, so from here, we can calculate the stretches themselves, which are the ratios of length rather than the square of the length of, of, of uh, the, the square of the ratio of length between the deformed and undeformed. And that matrix would, in, in again, in principal string direction, would look like lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, and all zeros here. Then what we can do is we can take this back to the original axis we worked with, and this would define for us what we call the stretch tensor. So stretch tensor which is called U is such that U squared equals C. So essentially it's like a matrix square root of Cauchy. So if you multiply u by itself as a matrix, you get uh, Cauchy. And this applies in any axis. Of course, it's easy to see how it applies in principal directions, but it, it applies in general. OK, very well. So what about the matrix F U inverse. This might not be very intuitive, but you will see that it will lead to a fairly interesting conclusion. Let's call this matrix A. Uh, 
And let us calculate A transpose times A. It will be U is symmetric, so U inverse transpose is U inverse, then F transpose, then F, then U inverse, which is nothing other than U inverse, F transpose F is C times U inverse, which is because U squared equals C is nothing other than unity matrix. And this means that A is actually a rotation matrix. So we can conclude from there that R equals F U inverse. U is symmetric, R is a rotation matrix. If you post multiply by U, then this leads to F equals R times U. F is our deformation gradient. R is rigid rotation. And U is, is stretch. Yeah, it just means that you take a piece of material and you stretch it along three perpendicular directions, which are the principal strain axis. So, in general, any deformation is, which is represented by F can be decomposed into two parts. One part is just pure strain in three perpendicular axes, and then followed by a rigid, a rigid rotation, and this form is called polar decomposition. Okay? All right, very well. Of course, we know that the formation gradient itself is I plus H, where H is the displacement gradient. So we can write this as I plus H equals R times U. So if we know the displacement, we can compute the displacement gradient. And then from there, we can compute R and U. And once we have R and U, we know the principal stretches, so the amount we stretched the material, and we know how much the material rigidly, rigidly rotated. All right, so now we need to define strains. Because so far, all what we have done is we analyzed the formation, but we haven't really defined what would our strains be. So we have two options. Either we go with the engineering strain definition, or we can work with the green strain definition. So if we work with engineering strain definition, so in the in principal axis, the stretches, which are the ratio of the new length to the old length, are simply lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, which represent our stretch tensor. This is in principal, principal strain direction, yeah? U is not always diagonal. It is only when you rotate it to principal strain directions that it looks diagonal. So what would be the engineering strain in this case? It will be ratio of the deformed length, undeformed length, minus 1. So we can think about our strain, engineering strain, as lambda 1 minus 1, lambda 2 minus 1, lambda 3 minus 1. This is how it is represented in principal strain direction. And this looks like that strain 
equals stretch minus a unity matrix. And we can now take this to be the definition of our strain in any direction, regardless of whether u is diagonal or not. So we can define our strain to be stretch minus unity matrix. As usual, the trouble with um, the engineering definition of strain is that it's just too complicated to compute because in order to calculate u from the displacement gradient, we need to do polar decomposition, which is a fairly complicated process. It requires eigenvalues and eigenvectors and a lot of headaches. So that's the first option. The second option is to go with a green strain. If you remember, in principal strains, C looked like in the principal directions, lambda 1 squared, lambda 2 squared, lambda 3 squared, where each one of these lambdas were the ratio of the deformed length to the undeformed length along one of the three principal strain directions. So if you want to calculate green strain, it was just square of the length deformed minus square of the length undeformed over two times the square of the length in the undeformed configuration. And this would look like, in principle, strain directions as lambda 1 squared minus 1 over 2, lambda 2 squared minus 1 over 2, and lambda 3 squared minus 1 over 2. And Again, off diagonal elements are zeros. And in matrix form, we can write this as, uh, sorry, this would be E green. We can write this as green strain equals one half C minus unity matrix. And this here, is the second possible definition of strain that we might use. The nice thing about the green strain definition is that C is nothing other than F transpose times F. So essentially, and F itself is nothing other than um, I plus H. So C is easily computed from displacement. H is obtained just by differentiation. And then C is obtained just by simple matrix multiplication. And from that, we can easily compute our green strain. If we go through the multiplication and simplify, we end up with the following expression of green strain in terms of the displacement gradient. It would be equal to one half H plus H transpose. And this is nothing but the symmetric part of the displacement gradient plus one half H transpose H. So you can easily see what we have seen in the case of one dimensional uh, bars is that green strain ends up being two parts, a linear part in displacement and a quadratic part in displacement. And this actually is the most convenient definition of strain in terms of being able to solve analytically. So this is the one that people usually use. So we're going to use green strain as our, let's say, way of describing strains. And we will assume that the stresses of the material are functions of green strain. Of course, this is not a course on large deformation as such. 
So these expressions here are for the most general case of deformation. In structures, usually strings are not large. And as such, we can simplify these expressions quite considerably. And this is what we're going to do later. <laughs>